I'm very happy that our first speaker is Dr. Robert S. Wicks. He completed his PhD in the history of art at Cornell in 1983 and joined the faculty at Miami University of Ohio uh, later that same year. He was a Fulbright lecturer at Silpa Korn University in Bangkok in Thailand and a visiting professor of Asian studies at Kansai Gaidai University in Osaka, Japan. He served as director of the Miami University Art Museum for the last two decades of his career until his retirement in 2021. And his book, Money, Markets, and Trade in Early Southeast Asia, The Development of Indigenous Monetary Systems to AD 1400, was published in 1992, and it is still in print. Thank you so much. The boundaries referred to in my title are not only political, the most readily visible, at least on a map, but also methodological and interpretive. The vast majority of coins of the first millennium from mainland Southeast Asia have no inscriptions, are often referred to as symbolical coins, rendering an understanding of their attribution, date, and even function somewhat problematic. The examples shown here illustrate the range of material I'll be discussing. Amon Konk Srivatsa coin from southern Myanmar in the top left, a Rising Sun Srivatsa coin, the most widespread type on the early mainland, on the top right. A Vajrapitha Srivatsa coin from central Myanmar, ascribed to the ancient Pew, in the lower left. And a Chandra Dynasty bull Srivatsa coin from the Arakan coast, on the Bay of Bengal, in the lower right. Today's presentation will be organized as follows. First, an overview of Southeast Asian numismatics and areas of interest within it. Coin production in early Southeast Asia divided into five zones, which you see here. And to conclude, a review of some of the outstanding issues uh, in the field. Following this, of course, there will be time allowed for your discussion. First, a little bit about my background. As Pankaj mentioned, I studied Southeast Asian coinage traditions as part of my PhD work at Cornell University from 1976 to 1983. Following the completion of my dissertation, I published an article based upon one of its chapters. I then began looking at the larger question of money use, not just coinage, in the region. Money Markets and Trade, as noted, came out in 1992 and is still in print. A crowdsourced list of the most influential books on Southeast Asian archaeology ranked Money, Markets, and Trade as number three. And many of my articles are available for free download on academia.edu. The last two decades of my academic career were spent as director of the Miami University Art Museum. My numismatic studies were placed on the back burner. In the meantime, much progress has been made including numerous articles in the ONS Journal by several of those in present today, and books by Michael Michener, Dietrich Malo, Boz and Nasir, Rona Chai, to name but a few. This is all very important and significant work, yet the utility of these numismatic studies has not yet reached most academic researchers. How do we encourage historians, archeologists, and museum professionals to more fully engage in what the field has accomplished. Where do we go from here? Emmanuel Meyer at the National University Singapore is using machine intelligence to more efficiently sort South and Southeast Asian coins according to dye variety. The Dietrich Malo and Michael Michener collections have been approved for inclusion in his study. He is also looking at opportunities to document major Southeast Asian holdings. This is potentially great news for the field. One challenge, of course, is the current political unrest in Myanmar, which has made it impossible for Meyer to fully engage with his counterparts there. From my perspective as a numismatist and museum professional, what is needed is for us to develop a fully searchable coin database, including the ability to add comments, upload images from the field, sort to results, <clears throat> and produce customized reports. Excuse me. <clears throat> it would build upon the best features of sites like Xeno, 
and Coin, Coin Archives Pro and be accessible as well by non-English speaking users. This is my proof of concept site for a Southeast Asian numismatics digital archive on Omeka.net. Once implemented, it will become part of the larger ONS endeavor to create a unified online database. As a first step, Cornell University Libraries has agreed to host an annotated bibliography of Southeast Asian numismatics. This would be made available online to any interested party with access to the internet. At the same time, Cornell Southeast Asia Librarian has committed to acquiring either hard copy or digital versions of each item in the database, ensuring that researchers will have ready access to the full historiography of the field. I invite your participation in this effort. So, on to my presentation. The region under discussion encompasses the modern day countries of Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. During the first millennium on the mainland, there were five zones of coin production and use, chiefly lowland and coastal phenomena. We'll be looking at them in the following order. Zone one, the smallest, Pegu and Thaton in southern Myanmar along the Sitong and Salween rivers. Zone two, the central Myanmar along the Irrawaddy River and its tributaries. Zone three, the Chapya Basin in Thailand. Zone four, the Bay of Bengal region. And zone five, the Mekong Delta. Significantly, this early coinage tradition on the mainland does not continue beyond the 10th century. In fact, the most well-known Southeast Asian kingdoms, Pagan and Angkor, while partially monetized, were not coin-using economies. The reason for this movement away from coin use at the end of the first millennium is not yet fully understood. This is Pagan in central Myanmar, prominent in the 12th and 13th centuries, you can see the Irrawaddy River in the background. 12th century Angkor in Cambodia was what has been described as a hydraulic society with strong administrative controls over water. In the lower left, you can see the moat surrounding the main temple and the Western Barai in the distance. Today, I will provide my perspective on early Southeast Asian numismatics. During the first millennium, a silver conch Srivata type, as noted, from lower Myanmar became the basis for nearly all coinage on the mainland. Numismatic geography. The study of ge the geographical distri distribution of coins recovered from archaeological excavations, as well as hoards and surface finds, is of particular interest. In this discussion, I'll focus on coins of known provenance. Typological development. I'll be using a typological scheme I developed to describe the types in major groupings, class A, class B, class C, and so forth. While the assumption is that class A coins are the earliest in any particular series, typological progression does not necessarily imply chronological succession in every instance. Thus, while linearity is often assumed, we must also allow for parallel developments and even archaizing trends. The symbols found on the coins, their identification, origin, and meaning. Much has been written about the significance of the symbols used on this early coinage. Caution, however, must be exercised when applying Indian meaning to symbols in a Southeast Asian setting. I'll provide one perspective for you today. And metrology. With few exceptions, it is not known for certain what metrological systems were in use during the first millennium. For this reason, I prefer to specify, for instance, a full unit coin, a quarter unit coin, and so forth. Metallurgical studies. This is an area that requires much greater attention. Metallurgical analysis is valuable in helping to identify forgeries, which have been prevalent since at least the 1960s and it can be particularly useful in identifying the sources of precious metals used in early coinage. Was the metal imported or refined from locally available ores? And uh, mint technology. 
Because few mint-related tools, dyes, and molds have been recovered archaeologically, it is necessary to use techniques of reverse engineering to sort out the various processes used to produce early coinage. And of course, coin circulation. Coins are recovered only at the end of their life as a circulating medium. There are any number of possible ways a coin might reach its final resting place through trade or commercial exchange, as a result of a raid by a neighboring kingdom, as tribute, as part of a foundation deposit, as a religious offering for safekeeping during times of political unrest, or simply due to accidental loss. So let's turn now to an examination of the coins themselves, beginning with Zone 1. Zone 1 is an area encompassing coastal Pegu and Taton in lower Myanmar. It has an ancient history associated primarily with the Mon culture. The main ancient coin found in the area is a silver conch Srivatsa type, with a finely executed high-relief naturalistic conch on the obverse surrounded by a regular beaded border. The reverse design is slightly concave, displaying a temple facade like Srivatsa in high relief, and inside this is an Ankusha or elephant goad. Most specimens have two beads in the exurb. The coins are usually dated to the 5th century. The Srivatsa is an ancient Indian auspicious symbol associated with the goddess Lakshmi, meaning beloved of Sri. It is frequently linked to individuals who have been blessed with good fortune. Not limited to Hinduism, both the Hong Kong and the Srivatsa became widespread as part of a set of auspicious symbols known as the Ashtamangala or eight auspicious signs. Each individual element has not only a religious affinity, but also an association with kingship as part of the regalia displayed during the coronation of kings. In early Southeast Asia, the Ashtamangala are most often associated with Buddhism and by extension, kingly patronage of religion. This ivory comb from Southern India, excavated in Thailand, is the earliest confirmed appearance of the eight auspicious signs in Southeast Asia, including a lotus at either end, a flowing vase, Srivatsa, parasol or royal umbrella, a conch and fly whisk. Significantly, the conch and Srivatsa are placed to either side of the royal umbrella, affirming their importance. A second example of the Ashtamangala in early Southeast Asia is this Buddhist funerary urn from Myanmar, stamped with a number of auspicious emblems, most notably the flowing vase, paired fish, as well as the conch and Srivatsa. Note the sun and moon elements over the Srivatsa, similar to that found on early coins. The major finds of the type within the circled area within Sitong and Salween rivers in indicated by the X's on the map. Significantly, the geographical distribution of the type extends from the Bengal Delta in the west, the second coin was found there, to southern Vietnam, the third coin was discovered there. Kong Srivatsa class A coins display <clears throat> the physical characteristics one would expect from a die struck on a thick flan with a slightly higher relief obverse and a cupping of the reverse surface. Class B specimens display a slightly simplified conch on the obverse with an enlarged tip on the spire, slightly flattened rings and elongated aperture. The beaded border remains although less well defined. The reverse Srivatsa is irregularly executed with simplified elements on the interior. In addition to finds from southern Myanmar, two specimens were recovered during excavations in Vietnam, and these will be discussed later. Given the wide geographical distribution of the type, it's not surprising that Kong Srivatsa coinage had a significant influence on the development of later coinage on the mainland, although the mechanism, mechanisms for that are as yet unclear. The line on the map in the middle of the Malay Peninsula on the left represents the dividing point between mainland and island Southeast Asia, at least in terms of cultural uh, development. Ptolemy, in the second, the second century Roman geographer, called this area India Extra Gangam, 
or India beyond the Ganges. The Malay Peninsula is in the middle of the map, surrounded by blue. The peninsula is labeled Aria Kersaneos, or Golden Peninsula. A red line identifies an ancient cross-peninsula trade route. It is at the dividing line that we find a unique grouping of early coinage, derived from the silver Kontrivatsa series, but struck in gold. The site is called Krabi, the red bullet point on the map, an early trading center. It was a transshipment point for goods transported across the narrowest point of the Malay Peninsula. Thousands of ancient beads and ceramics have been found in this area, including a Roman aureus of Domitian and a local imitation with an Indic inscription reading Sri Vishnu Vamasa or of Vishnu Varma, a local ruler. These crudely struck imitations were found together with small gold Konk Srivatsa coins derived from the main Pegu silver series. Bridget Borel has identified a denominational structure of one, one-half, and one-eighth units, we're missing the one-quarter unit apparently, based upon the Abras Precatorius of so the 0.1 gram rosary P or Rati, giving eight Rati, four Rati, and one Rati denominations. She considers the coins to have been locally minted within a period between the second and fourth centuries. This gives rise to a quandary. If the gold coins of Krabi are to be dated between the second and fourth centuries, how can they derive from a pe the Pegu series of a century or two later? Or are our dates simply that uncertain? It is likely that we have to rethink the dating of the coins, an incredibly large and complicated project, which of course is beyond the scope of today's talk. One collector has organized his holdings of early Southeast Asian coinage from the mainland as shown here. The Kong Srivata Class A coin in the upper right is attributed to the Mona Pegu and dated to the fifth century, not an unreasonable assumption based on what we know presently. The other three symbolic coins in his collection are attributed to individual Pew cities, Halin, Bekthano, and Sri Kshetra, and provided with very specific dates, in one instance within a three-decade range. As will be demonstrated, this level of certainty is unlikely, given what is actually known about the chronology of Pew cities and coin production in ancient Myanmar. With that, we'll turn to Zone 2, the ancient Pew sites of Myanmar. Zone 2, associated with the ancient Pew, as mentioned, is situated in central Myanmar along the tributaries and banks of the Irrawaddy River. Three major Pew sites with significant urban assemblages have been identified, Halin in the north, Bekthano, and Sri Kshetra. Coin finds are marked with an X. This table shows the major artifacts associated with each of these urban centers. Halin has the smallest city enclosure at 1,460 acres, Bekthano with 2,196 acres, and Sri Kshetra is the largest at 4,645 acres. Each has distinctive pew gates and Buddhist stupa forms. Coins have been discovered at each of the three sites. Seals, inscriptions, and pew Buddhist sculpture have also been recovered. The major period of pew cultural production has been dated between the 4th and 9th centuries. We'll begin with Sri Kshetra, the largest of the three Orbit, urban centers. This map shows the location of Sri Kshetra, the distribution of coin finds and inscriptions written in the local Pew language marked with a P and imported Sanskrit marked with an S. World heritage status was granted in 2014. At the bottom right is the silver reliquary from the Kinba Mound, an undisturbed deposit possibly dating to the sixth century and included some 45 silver pew coins. The style of sculpture is closely associated with that of 3rd to 4th century Nagarjuna Konda and Andhra Pradesh and the east coast of India, indicating close ties between the two regions. Of all the coins found in the Sri Kshetra area, the Bhadrapita Srivatsa type is the most common. 
In class A, shown here, the obverse conch of the conch Srivatsa coins has been replaced by a Bhadrapita, a royal throne stool, a symbol found within many Indian religious traditions. Some writers have identified the motif of a, as a Damaru, or Indian hand drum, or even a fire altar, due to the flame-like elements above the upper triangles. Today, most scholars accept the Bhadrapita designation. A solid line and beaded border encircles the design. The reverse Srivatsa has been expanded to allow for the placement of the conch on the interior. In addition to finds in central Myanmar, one specimen was found in southern Vietnam together with a conch Srivatsa Class A coin. A local Buddhist association of the Bhadrapita is affirmed by this pew votive tablet depicting the historical Buddha calling the earth to witness prior to his enlightenment. In addition to the royal throne stool on the left, a conch, somewhat eroded, can be seen to the right of the figure. Both are protected by royal parasols. Class C represents the main series of Bhadrapita Srivatsa coins from Sri Kshetra. In addition to the full unit coins, one half and one quarter unit pieces are not uncommon. The type was widely distributed in Myanmar and has also been reported in Thailand, with at least one badly worn specimen found in Cambodia. On the reverse of Class C coins, the interior of the simplified Srivatsa becomes a series of rectilinear or triangular forms arranged in three rows. Above the Srivatsa is an open bead moon and radiant sun. To the left of the symbol is an elaborate Vajra, or thunderbolt, and to the right is a simplified conch, which has now migrated from the obverse to the reverse to an ancillary position. Two or three wavy lines, perhaps representing water, are below. The Bhadrapita design as found on the Class C coins has been reported on at least one clay seal from Sri Kshetra. And the reverse design has become the identifying emblem of the Sri Kshetra Heritage Trust. Class D coins are somewhat broader, more even in design and execution than Class C coins. As far as I am aware, they've only been recovered from sites in Myanmar. The odd obverse Bhadrapitha has a much more rounded bottom. The reverse interior of the Srivatsa takes on the form of an obelisk with droplets at either side, and the sun has lenticular rays. The Vajra is more elaborate in form. Like Class C, Class D coins are found in multiple denominations, and a large number of ceilings have been recovered from Shikrachetra reproducing the Class D type. The Sri Kshetra Museum's 2022 inventory, published in December actually, includes Bhadrapita Srivata classes C and D coins, together with the Rising Sun Class A of the fine style. The Rising Sun type will be discussed later. Unfortunately, few coins are found in the collection, and most examples were donated by local villagers. Excavation coins, as far as I'm aware, are not represented. However, a significant Sri Kshetra coin find is in the National Museum, which includes two Bhadrapita Srivata Class C and one Bhadrapita Class D coin. Four Rising Sun Srivata coins of various classes are noted, including three transitional types. Haleen is the northernmost major pew site. It was included in the 2014 uh, World Heritage designation, and this has proven to be a mixed blessing. The photograph on the lower right shows a scene in mid-2022 when some 10,000 people a day swarmed the site after cultural remains were found by villagers. This drawing of coins found at Haleen includes a Bhadrapita Srivatsa Class B coin, a variety not yet reported at Sri Kshetra, and a Rising Sun Srivatsa Class A coin together with a subsidiary unit of the same design. So let's look at the two new coins. While Bhadrapita Class B is clearly divide, derived from Class A coins, the execution is less well refined. The variety has been attributed to Haleen by some researchers. 
Rising Sun Class A coins are impressive pieces with the main type executed in a very fine style uh, struck on a broad flan. On the obverse, the a rising sun motifs with beads between its rays is enclosed by a solid circular line, a beaded perimeter and linear outer border encircling it. A horizon line divides the coin roughly in half. The type has been ascribed to Helene by collectors and dealers. The reverse Srivatsa is simplified with the interior made up of two triangular forms, an open bead moon and radiant sun can be seen above. To the left and right of the main element is a swastika and a badrapita. This is a gold ring with a stamp badrapita design nearly identical to that found on the rising sun coins. It displays the three beads above, simplified from the flame-like elements found on the Badrapita Srivatsa coins, and ear-like projections on the arms of the throne stool. The fact that a stamp was in use to was used to impress the design implies the ability to produce coin dies as well. Both coin types have been adopted by Helene as a mod modern cultural emblem. This is the exterior of the Helene Archaeological Museum, displaying reliefs of the Rising Sun and Badrapita Srivatsa coins, with the detail of the Rising Sun coin on the facade of the museum. The coin display, at a coin, the coin display at the Helene Museum includes Rising Sun coins of several varieties and Badrapita Srivatsa classes B, C, and D and two transitional rising sun coins of a type noted at Sri Kshetra. You can see them at the bottom of the second row from the left. Bekthano is located between Halin and Sri Kshetra. Although larger than Halin, Bekthano has produced far fewer coins. Most likely this has to do with the fact that less archeological work has been done at the site. The rising sun type is often associated with the site. Examples known to have been recovered there uh, are of the irregular style, such as this specimen. An archaeological report of excavations at Bekthano illustrate a full unit rising sun coin and two subsidiary Badrapita Srivatsa and rising sun pieces. To return to our collector and his coins, what will be noted is that while each of the coin types have been recovered at Halin, Bekthano, and Sri Kshetra, only the Badrapita Srivatsa coins have much claim to be as being ascribed to Sri Kshetra as a place of issue. The compartmentalized dates are simply not defensible given the present state of our knowledge, although somewhere between the 4th and 9th centuries is likely. In addition to the standard series examined up to this point, Pew and Moan sites have also produced a number of transitional types. Let's look at just one example. In this rare transitional type, known chiefly from southern Myanmar, the conch has become balloon-like, filling much of the coin's surface. The shell's aperture is schematized into a question mark-like incus. The reverse temple-like facade has added several ancillary symbols derived from pew practice. A beaded sun in the upper left and crescent moon in the upper right remain. A simplified vajra has been added to the left of the Srivatsa, while a fly whisk can be seen to the right. Inside the Srivatsa is an ankusha or elephant goad. Below the Srivatsa is a fish swimming to the left, replacing the wavy lines representing water of the pew series. The significance of this Moan type is that it can be linked to coins produced in the, to the east in present-day Thailand, associated with another Moan culture region, the, Mo, the kingdom known as Davaravati. Zone 3 encompasses the Chao Pya River Basin and Central Thai Plain. The two major urban centers associated with Mon Davaravati are Utong and Nongkhon Patong in southwestern Thailand. The standing Buddha of the 7th to 8th century is an example of the dominant Gupta-inspired artistic tradition of the region. 
the first appearance of the name Devadavati in, local in, in a local inscription, rather than from Chinese historical accounts, is on a series of 6th to 7th century silver medals inscribed Sri Devadavati Savarapunya, or meritorious deed of the ruler of Devadavati. Their presence at Nakompatom and Utong defines the geographic core of the Devadavati polity. Silver coins found at those sites include the conch over temple with Vajra series. The conch and the obverse has become balloon-like, derived from the Mon transitional coins of Lower Myanmar, examined earlier. Likewise, the Srivatsa has been transformed into the facade of a temple. Uh, in the interior is a double Vajra or trident. Ancillary symbols are a fly whisk on the left and elephant goad on the right. A fish swimming to the left or right can be seen below. Here you can more easily distinguish the key elements of the design found on Class C coins. Few of the surviving specimens are as well struck as this example. The differences in fabric between the various classes of conch or temple with Vajra coins in Thailand points to both chronological distinctions and more than likely different mint locations, as yet undetermined. Class A coins, for instance, appear to be struck on a thick cast flan, whereas Class D coins are struck on an irregular hammered planchet. Although the silver coins are struck between two dies, stone molds carved with the design of the obverse conch have been reported, as you see here. This is one half of a two-part mold, and is of a type that of a, of a type that really deserves further study. In the lower left and lower right designs correspond to the conch or temple with Vajra class C coins. More than likely, these molds would have been used to cast base metal pieces, examples of which are known. Whether these coins would have been would have represented a subsidiary coinage, unofficial issues, or counterfeits is presently unknown. These are Konka were temple with Vajra class C coins on exhibit at the Utong National Museum. The coins in the top row have been deliberately mutilated. The two bottom coins of uncertain type have been cut into quarters to produce fractional coinage, a practice also found in Cambodia and Vietnam, most likely reserved for imported coins. A small hoard consisting of thin silver bracteates with a simple conch design associated with class D coins and another find, and silver ingots was recently discovered at Utong. It has been dated to the seventh century. In addition to displaying the local conch or the temple with Vajra series, this coin exhibit at the Prapatom National Museum in Nakompatom includes a large number of rising sun coins, some of which have been cut halfway through, perhaps for testing metallic purity or as a, a ritual gesture. In the middle is an example of a terracotta coin mold, again of uncertain origin and purpose. This exhibit highlights the fact that Mon Devadavati is unique and that both inscribed metals along with symbolical coins were produced in relatively large quantities. Up to this point, the discussion has been limited to the symbolical coins of early mainland Southeast Asia. Zone 4 on the Bay of Bengal produced a remarkable series of coins inscribed with the names of its rulers, the Chandra kings of ancient Arakan, no, now Rakhine, and their successors. An early urban center was situated at Veshali, and it was here that the Chandra dynasty was established in about the 4th century or so. The map does not include the coin finds within Bangladesh, further north, associated with Samatata and Harikela. Much of what is known about the early rulers of Arakan is derived from the Ananda Chandra pillar inscription erected in the 8th century or later. It lists the long line of rulers extending into the distant past. Because the absolute dates are still in question, and there is a recent ONS journal article revisiting the issue, the emphasis here, of course, is on the coin designs themselves. There is also uncertainty about the relationship between the Arakan Chandras and the Chandra rulers of Bengal. This coin demonstrates the transition from the anepigraphic Konk Srivatsa series 
to an inscribed coinage, here associated with Raja Chandra, the second ruler of the dynasty. The Konk on the obverse and Srivatsa on the reverse are nestled in a series of comma-shaped details, almost like a splash pattern. Both the obverse and reverse designs are enclosed by two rows of beads divided by a solid circular line. The Srivatsa takes on a different shape from what we have seen up to this point, as the composed and is composed of two opposed S shapes facing a central vertical element with a diamond-shaped middle section. It has a flat base with comma-shaped ends. Above the Srivatsa is a crescent moon and solid bead sun. The, the coin is inscribed Raja above the conch to the left. Significantly, the inscription is squeezed into the design as if an afterthought. Devachandra, the fourth ruler of the dynasty, introduced a bull Srivatsa coin. The inscription Deva now has adequate room to be read properly. The reverse Srivatsa with vine continues. The bull is likely the dynastic emblem, usually associated with Shiva. In this coin, struck by Bhumi Chandra, the seventh, seventh ruler in the Chandra line, the Srivatsa dominates the space, with the projecting elements taking the nature of a foliate vine. The coin was struck in a dumpy flan too small for the dyes. This Quarter unit coin of Niti Chandra, the ninth ruler of the dynasty, was struck on a thinner hammered flan. The Srivatsa is now in a field of its own. The beads below the flat base remain. In this issue by Dharma Vijaya, uh, the arms of the Srivatsa are sickle like, taking on the appearance of the Trishula or trident. This is continued in the coins of the Akara rulers of the Bengal Delta region, as well as those of Harikela, in which the place name in which the name of the ruler is replaced by a geographical place name. Today, the reverse Srivatsa design has been adopted by a number of rebel organizations in Rakhine, fighting against the central government of Myanmar. It would be interesting to know how they interpret the designs on the coins issued by their distant ancestors. We now turn to the fifth zone, the Mekong Delta region of southern Cambodia and Vietnam. I call it the Funan problem. The earliest kingdom in Southeast Asia is Funan, identified by Chinese geographers as having existed in the region between the first and sixth centuries of the Common Era. There are no local inscriptions which mention Funan, which is likely the Chinese transliteration of the Khmer word Phnom, or mountain. As you can see from these maps, there are widely divergent views on its geographical extent. The map on the left adheres to the limited geography view, while the map on the right takes Chinese accounts of Funan's extent quite literally, including under its sway all of Cambodia and much of the Malay Peninsula. The problem, of course, is that we really don't know the extent or even the nature of the Funan polity. Was it a kingdom, a city-state, or a small empire? In March 1971, National Geographic published this two-page spread and finds from Akeo in southern Vietnam attributed to Funan. Items recovered from the site included gold jewelry, seals, beads, and of course, coins. The rising sun Srivatsa and Konk Srivatsa coins are described there as the two sides of a silver Funanese coin beside a smaller one, both from AD 300 to 400. French archaeologist Louis Malaret began work at Akeo in 1942 during World War II. His reports were not published until the late 1950s and early 1960s. Excavations were suspended from the mid-1940s until the 1970s, following the end of the Vietnam War. As you can see, Malare called his finds recent discoveries related to the archaeology of Funan. Since that time, the Funanese attribution has been dominant. This is what the area looks like today. 
These pictures are from my visit to Vietnam in 2017, and it's a view from a small hill where we're standing on the left, and at the summit on the right, uh, you can see the base of an ancient Hindu shrine. Now, the National Geographic artist used these photographs from Malaray to produce his spread. The larger coin is a Rising Sun Srivatsa Class A coin of irregular style. Notice that the Bhadrapita is now on the left, while the swastika is to the right of the reverse Srivatsa. The smaller coin is a typical Konk Srivatsa Class B specimen from southern Myanmar. Both coins, therefore, are imports into the region and shouldn't be called Funanese coins at all. All the same, for various reasons, Malare's identification of the coins with Funan persists to this day. Many collectors and dealers now refer to Rising Sun coins as being of the, quote, Funan type, end quote, or attributing them to Bekthano Pu Funan type, or to Burma Pu coinage Sri Kshetra period of the Funan monarchy. Of course, these attributions are wildly inaccurate, yet widely used. Okay. Two of the concrete Vatsa coins recovered by Malare from Makeo are exhibited at the Museum of Vietnamese History in Ho Chi Minh City in the lower left. The rest of the case is filled with rising sun Sri Vatsa coins and segments from sites in southern Vietnam. Full unit coins were likely imported from elsewhere on the mainland and cut into segments locally, providing a clear indication of a one, one half, one quarter, and one eighth denominational structure for local monetary units. They are identified not with Funan, but with the Okeo culture after the type site excavated by Malare. In fact, most Vietnamese archaeologists would prefer to do away with the term Funan and use Akeo culture instead, as shown in this map. While the Vietnamese map is limited to sites in Vietnam proper within the last decade, a significant number of rising sun coins have been reported in Cambodia, reaffirming that the Akeo culture is not limited to Vietnam, but extends further west and north than is implied by the museum map. These coins are from a find at Angkor Bure in southern Cambodia. So in several respects, we must be willing to move beyond established boundaries in terms of terminology, as well as attribution as we attempt to gain a better understanding of early coinage in Southeast Asia. To conclude, the Funan example should be a reminder that it is relevant and indeed crucial to discuss not only coin production within any area, but coin use as well. Well, this is not too difficult when dealing with the inscribed coins of the Rakhine coast of Myanmar and the Bengal Delta region. The picture quickly becomes less clear when attempting to categorize the symbolical coins of mainland Southeast Asia and the Rising Sun series in particular. The full publication of more coin hoards from the region will be of great benefit there. Related to this, of course, is the need for a broad-based metallurgical study. Without such a corpus of comparative data, we will always remain limited in our understanding of ancient mint practice. The discrepancies between the attributions of any given coin type by different authorities uh, brings into sharp focus the need to revisit the dating of numismatic material from across the mainland. This is a large undertaking, uh, undertaking and will require the cooperation of archaeologists, art historians, epigraphers, coin dealers, museums, and private collectors. In addition, and I don't have any real thoughts on how to move forward with this, we need to develop a system for assessing the reliability of information related to reported coin funds. How do we limit ourselves to confirmed finds, and what does that really mean? How accurate is the information that has been provided to us? Did the individual want to disguise the actual source of a particular coin find? I'd also like to see an in-depth study of the motifs on the coins. Where did the individual elements originate, and how does their symbolism and meaning change over time and space? Related this is a better understanding of the basic concepts of coin design 
within the region, and I sort of alluded to some of this here. What were the models that the ancient coin makers drew upon? With your support of the proposed ONS digital database, and especially the Southeast Asia section, at least some of these questions can be answered. And to help begin the question and answer portion of the program, I'll leave you with this image. Thank you for your time this morning, and I look forward to your comments. I'm clapping on behalf of all the participants. That was, that was really fascinating.